Hello, people. So, um, first things first, I have got a haircut, lost it. Also, I had a shave today, so that's my new look, but it's still, uh, still Nathan. Um, just a quick one before I forget. Uh, one of my subscribers, uh, Tomo, you you sent me a link uh, on the Facebook page. I have a Facebook page for this, um, for this channel. I don't use it as much as I probably should. But uh, you sent a message about um, the rise of Welsh nationalism. Um, of course, I'm a unionist, so I take interest in that sort of subject. But honestly, I don't know um, that much about the situation in Wales regarding how this is on the rise. So thanks for drawing my attention to that. Um, I, uh, I want to amalgamate a few different subjects here, as I often do. There'll be a bit of overlap, but... I was browsing YouTube earlier and I got a recommended video, goodness knows why, I don't know how YouTube comes up with these things, but basically um, it was a clip from the show Britain's Got Talent, um, which really needs no introduction, it was a very popular show in this country, um, I'm not sure if it's still being aired or if it's um, kind of, if it was still ongoing during the pandemic or not, but um, obviously there, it would be a different dimension because they're not going to have the studio audiences. Um, that's actually an interesting social thing about this pandemic, the, the huge influence it's had on entertainment. Um, obviously the cinema situation, but also li live entertainment like uh, TV shows, um, at least live for the studio audience. Sporting events, you know, have been greatly scaled back. Um, I was listening to LBC the other night, uh, not for very long, but the subject they were discussing was about what sort of social implications could change after COVID. I mean, uh, historically, pandemics have led to um, social implications. In the wake of the Black Death, there was uh, the rise of the Renaissance. So something good came out of something very bad. Um, the Labour Party uh, has sort of put forward the idea, I mean, I'm not saying this is a form of policy, but I've heard Labour uh, ministers talk about having a 1945 moment whereby this would be an opportunity to um, kind of start afresh. Uh, 1945, of course, Clement Attlee's landslide election win uh, that gave birth to the modern welfare state the birth of the NHS. Now, the foundations of the welfare state in this country actually go right back to the Liberal government of Campbell Bannerman, Asquith and Lloyd George, but it was under that Attlee government that, for example, the NHS was formed, um, created. So it might well be that coronavirus, terrible as it is insofar as the death toll and in terms of the effect on the economy, there may actually be some good comes out of it. Who knows? Uh, there may might be f things that we can reflect on as a society. Uh, anyway, to go back to what was saying, this clip from Britain's Got Talent, uh, I've seen it before. Um, I don't know why it came up. But anyway, uh, it was two, two girls who were uh, best friends and they they were auditioning for, um, you know, singing. Um, Abby and Lisa, uh, they the video kind of went viral because basically they had quite an unprofessional attitude. They clearly weren't very talented. And um, in the end, one of them actually punched the other on, uh, you know, um, as they stormed off the set. But what was interesting was they, when it was clear that they weren't um, very good, the audience predictably started booing them, jeering them. And uh, one of them told the audience to shut up, which must have just been a spontaneous reaction. Uh, now, Simon Kyle um, sort of reprimanded her and said, well, to be fair, you told them to shut up before you even started singing. He failed to mention that the audience started booing before she said that. Um, and, you know, this is this is viral, it had millions of views and still online. I don't know what those two women have done since, if they have kind of got any sort of development in their career or not. Um, but, you know, people laugh at it and it's all a big joke, but 
psychiatrists uh, criticised Britain's Got Talent for the effect it might have on the mental health of participants. One psychiatrist described it as a freak show because if you look at Britain's Got Talent, it's a good example of cynicism of reality TV. Um, you know, they deliberately allow people like those two girls through to the televised stage. For what? For what? So that they can be jeered at and laughed at because the producers know that there's an entertainment value in the fact that they're not very good. So I think that's incredibly cynical and I have very little respect for the whole format. I mean, I have little respect for the audience that cheers people. I have little respect for the judges who encourage it. Um, I just think the whole thing is quite cynical and nasty. And I'm also aware and somewhat depressed by the fact that shows like Britain's Got Talent are very popular. I mean, at the time, like I said, I don't know if it's still screened or not, but certainly at the peak, it was probably Britain's most watched show. It was famously said that more people voted in, it was either X Factor or Britain's Got Talent, than in the general election. It would have been around, um, I don't know, 2010 or 2005, that election's referring to. But I just find the whole format of that to be very, um, very cynical. And... I just don't think it's entertaining to watch people being good in that way. Call me old fashioned, call me sensitive, but I think it's um it's quite nasty. Um because people, you know, a lot of the people that go on those shows are a bit deluded. They're not talented. And I'm certainly no singer, but I can see that. And, you know, maybe the friends have told them that or something, but why are the producers letting them through to the te televised stage? if for no other reason, because you need to get through various stages. So why are they being let through? Um, that's a prominent example. Uh, I've spoken a lot about the Jeremy Kyle show. Now, the reason I haven't mentioned it recently is because it's gone. It's, it's history, thank goodness. But it's unfortunate that it came out of the situation that uh, one of the guests committed suicide. Now, I'm not going to say that man was a nice person. Um, from what I've read, he wasn't, but the point is, um, there is something that has changed, in, and I'll probably come back to that in a minute. Something has changed since the 1990s. If you look at entertainment, and I'm focusing here on the UK, because in America, reality TV, you know, shows like Jerry Springer have been around, like they went right back to the 80s, Maury Povich and so on. In Britain, um, you know, we had a slower development in terms of that sort of format. But if you look at the 1990s, typical Saturday night entertainment would be things like Stars in the Rise, uh, which is, you know, for British viewers, you might remember, it was presented by Matthew Kelly, and it was basically people would um, dress up as their music idol, and they would, they they not just dress up like them, it was like they got all the makeup and all, it was very well done, uh, and they would sing. Now, they had to have a voice. They didn't just, you know, it wouldn't be any fan. They had to have singing ability as well. But that was an entertaining show. I liked it. And I thought it was, it was all good natured. You know, Matthew Kelly encouraged them. The audience encouraged them. There was no jeering of contestants or of, uh, and at the end of the night, the uh, five people who were singing, one of them would, would win. The audience would deem to be the best. But there, it was, there was no mean spiritness about it. All of them were um, kind of applauded and encouraged. Um, a show like Crystal Maze was challenging, um, although you might say that some of the tasks were easy. But, you know, it, was, it wasn't it was mean-spirited. Um, even Gladiators, which, you know, you had a bit, of, uh, a bit of theatrics going on. Again, it wasn't mean-spirited. Um, blind Date. Um, I think for the most part it wasn't. Towards the end it started changing its format and it started going down south I think because in the end the format was to sort of um, have the person that was rejected kind of hang back and then see if they change their mind. I didn't like that. So the earlier blind dates were more straightforward like you know it was all easy going and the, the guy or the girl would ask the three potential dates questions and then they choose one and that would be it. Um, 
But generally, if you look at 90s entertainment by comparison to what started developing in the 2000s, there's definitely a change. Big Brother uh, was launched in 2000 in this country. Uh, then came the Jeremy Kyle Show in 2005. Britain's Got Talent, X Factor, and I can't recall what years they were launched, but there was a trajectory to this sort of entertainment. Even if you look at something like um, Hell's Kitchen and Gordon Ramsay, and I've spoken about all these things in other videos, but I'm kind of looking them all together here because it's a trajectory. In the case of Gordon Ramsay and Hell's Kitchen, the entertainment value, apparently, is Gordon Ramsay just yelling in people's faces, telling them how worthless they are. And I've heard the excuses for that. Oh, uh, he's putting them in their place and they are deluded and, you know, they need to know that this isn't the right way to cook or something like that. I, I don't dispute that he knows what he's talking about. I don't dispute that he's a world-class chef. I don't dispute that some of the people he's remonstrating with maybe um, are on profession and maybe do need the reality check. What I question is why, you know, yelling in someone's face is marketed as entertainment. And people say it's, uh, oh, well, he's not really like that. It's all for the cameras. Well, that isn't better. That, that is just cynical. If that is what sells, it's just cynical. Um, even Dragon's Den. I mean, it's not as bad as the others, but it's... And I get the idea. It's meant to show the the hard edge reality to business, right? Business isn't an easy world. It can be um, demanding and cutthroat. But again, all of these shows, you know, there is a focus on putting people on the spot, on pressure, on humiliation in a way that I don't think you had before. Um, in the case of Jeremy Kyle, um, or as I like to call it, the Jeremy Vile show, you know, this guy would bring on so-called guests to resolve problems. And sometimes the problems were resolved, okay? Because the producers weren't stupid. They knew that they had to kind of justify their existence. So, uh, you know, there were, there would be situations where people's problems would be resolved. But then the, the fallout from that was you had empirical evidence showing that people were misled. A notorious example was when a man was told he would be reconciled with his wife. What happens? Kyle brings out her new lover on stage and there is a there's a confrontation and the man headbutts his love rival. Now that wouldn't have happened if Kyle hadn't stoked up the situation. It ended up with a man was uh, charged in court with common assault. But the judge at the time, and it's one of the few occasions I agreed with the judge, he said if I had my, my way the producers would be in court as well. Um, I think it was utterly pathetic that Kyle couldn't show his face at the parliamentary committee. It showed that fundamentally he was a card, because he could dish out the abuse. But when it turned on him, he couldn't take it. I I have no problem saying Jeremy Kyle is a card. Um, and you know, people think it's about feeling sorry for the guests. It's not so much that. Some of those guests were really horrible people. You know, you had wife beaters, you had um, petty criminals, you had con artists. There were some pretty nasty individuals on there. But here's the catch. People who support Jeremy Kyle because, oh, he's putting them on the spot or he's holding them to account. How do you, how do you justify then that the producers paid their money to appear? So this tough guy, Jeremy Kyle, you know, he was actually paying them. That's a great irony about it. So he would remonstrate some guy beating up his girlfriend or some benefit cheat or something like that, but then give them a hundred quid to be on the show or whatever it was. Um, probably more than that. So that's hypocritical. You know, he's rewarding them just so he can then kind of put them on the spot. And he would always come out with this really smug line, we're not here to judge. Oh, but this is, and then, you know, stoke up his audience. By the way, I have a low opinion of people who go to that sort of studio audience just to feel good about themselves. You know, um, that's another side about reality TV I really, really don't like. There is a sort of a mob mentality about it. Um, and if you look at the Britain's Got Talent sort of audience, if, if everyone is booing someone, then they can kind of justify it to themselves. You know, they, they don't stop to think, well, how is that going to make the person on the stage feel? It's just cruel. It's just nasty. And 
it kind of disgusts me, to be quite honest. Um, I would urge anybody watching this, if you want to be successful in something, try and find other approaches to it. Because shows like this, they really don't give a damn about the contestants. They might occasionally, they might, you know, there will be good stories. There'll be people who said they had a very good experience. But in my opinion, that isn't enough to balance out the bad. It's not enough to justify some of the cynical, cruel techniques these shows use. And the sad thing is they do enjoy a lot of support. But, you know, with ITV especially, I would single ITV out. Because ITV has a long track record of putting ratings before um, Duty of Care, in my opinion. Um, because there's Jeremy, the Jeremy Kyle show, there is, uh, I don't know what channel Love Island was on, but, you know, Suicide's connected with that. What it needs to be understood, it doesn't matter if people agree to appear on these shows. You know, a lot of the people that go on these shows are mentally fragile to begin with. So it doesn't matter that they agree to something. That's like spiking someone and then making them do something. It's like, oh, well, they agreed. Um, there's a lot of dishonesty about these shows. And I really think that people need to be very careful before appearing on them. Um, because in the end of the day, the producers will say that they're professional. They'll say that there's a duty of care. But ultimately, their number one goal is ratings. They're a business. That's what they care about. So if that means humiliating someone or setting someone up, they will do it. Um, and I, I do think that the fallout from the Jeremy Carl show and the death of Caroline Flack last year, um, we really need to look at this and what we find entertaining. I, I'm not naive. I understand that I can't change the opinions of masses, right? But I would like to see a situation where more prominent people speak out against these things and say, well, actually, let's just step back a second. How is this entertaining? What are we doing here? What about, uh, you know, we hear about mental health. Well, what sort of mental health effect is this going to have on contestants, guests? Um, I really think that needs to be discussed. I, um, I would also say one other thing. When I'm talking about reality TV, I am talking about a particular kind of reality TV. I suppose you could say reality TV is a very big blanket term because there's things that are based on reality, documentary style, that I would say isn't necessarily bad. Um, investigative programs, that sort of thing. But I'm not saying that all reality TV is bad. I'm not saying it's all cynical. I just think that the entertainment side of reality TV has definitely went that way. And it's very sad to see. Um, you know, I'd like to see a return to not 90s TV, where, you know, in the 2020s, it's going to be different. But something that is, has the sort of, um, the good intentions and the, how can I put it, the, um, the feel-good factor. Rather than just, oh, let's laugh at people. Let's, let's see how much we can humiliate people to put them on the spot. And I'm not saying that before the 2000s, you know, this never happened. But I do think it's got a lot worse in the last two decades. And I think that's very, very sad. Um, it's like, a, it's a crowd mentality with the shows, studio audiences. And this can be extended to other areas. I mean, when you get disorder at a sporting event, and it's, I have to admit as a man, it's an aspect of male culture. Um, call it toxic masculinity. That's worth a whole debate in its own right. But you know, you get a bunch of guys, and they're not always young guys, sometimes older men as well, and they've had enough booze. Uh, their football team has lost, or their fighter, in the case of boxing, has lost, or won, or they disagree with the referee. It doesn't take a great deal for a mob mentality to set in, and then they start behaving like prats, and just, well, worse than that, behaving like animals. It is a very uh, ugly thing to see. And I've always taken the view that people are responsible for their own actions. So I think it's quite weak to follow the crowd. I think it's quite weak. You just think, oh, well, everyone else is doing it, so I'll do it. You know, if um, it's like when you get bullying, more often than not, it's a group dynamic as opposed to kind of the caricature of a big overbearing bully. Um, 
you know, like that that isn't I think reality is more a group dynamic of bullying where you get a group of people giving an individual a hard time. I'm not saying that you can't get individual bullies, but I think that group dynamic is more common. Um and it's it's horrible. So yeah, th this is just my opinions, but I would like to see something change in society coming out of this. Now I I've criticized I'll I'll just close with this. I've criticized woke ideology, I've criticized how oversensitivity can also be a very big problem. I think there is space in our society for political incorrectness. I think there is a space in our society, in fact a necessity for blunt talking. That doesn't mean I support cruelty. It doesn't mean that I think exploitation is ever something to hail. Um and I would like to see a change. Because the pandemic ostensibly has totally changed the format of entertainment whereby you get these shows um that no longer have a studio audience because of social distancing. Maybe it's time to reflect, well, do we we really want this format anymore? Or at least if it's going to be a studio audience. I mean here's the problem, it's difficult to say you're not allowed to boo, you're not allowed to cheer. It's very difficult to enact a sort of rule like that. But I do think the presenters and in the case of Britain's Got Talent, the judges, I think they encourage it sometimes. So I think it's reprehensible what they do, and I think they should be called out for not sort of reining in on it a little bit. You know, someone like Simon Carl has huge influence. He could easily turn around and say, look, let's give them a chance or something like that. But he chooses not to. Um, so I just think that sort of reality TV, in my mind, is trash. Let me know your thoughts.